All right, hi everybody. I'm super excited about this interview, not only for personal reasons, but professional reasons as well. And I, and I think you're gonna get a lot out of this. Today, I'm speaking with Art Markman, PhD. He's a professor of psychology and marketing at the University of Texas here in Austin. He's published over 150 scholarly works and growing by the day, pretty much. He specializes in topics like high-level thinking, um, some motivation, perform mental performance, analytical reasoning, and even decision-making, and especially creativity. Art serves as a director um, of the Program in Human Dimension of Organizations at the University of Texas. He spent nine years as the executive editor of the journal Cognitive Science, and he currently serves as a member of the editorial board of Cognitive, Cognitive Psychology. Art is also a co-host of one of my favorite podcasts and radio show, Two Guys on Your Head, which is produced here in Austin at KUT. And he's an author of four best-selling books, and he currently travels the world giving lectures to corporations and organizations, but he always returns back to his home here in Austin, Texas. Art, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Tom. It's always fun to talk to you. Awesome. Great. Well, fill us in a little bit more about what you're doing now. Where has things gone from where they were a couple years ago to where they are now? What are some things that you're seeing differently in your field? And we're going to kind of branch off into how psychology works in perception. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my work has gone in lots of different directions. You know, um, uh, the work I did with the Human Dimensions of Organizations program broadened what I do a little bit because we take all of the liberal arts, the humanities, social and behavioral sciences, in order to help people to think about the people that they engage with in the workplace. And so I, I've spent a lot of time trying to bring all of that together. We launched an undergraduate major here at the University of Texas in HDO. And it's a, it's a weird thing to have a bunch of undergrads walking around a campus uh, talking about majoring in something whose name you stuck on a document randomly several years ago. So it's, uh, it, it, that's been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm also uh, now working uh, also in addition uh, with the IC Squared Institute, and we are, are doing, a, which, which has a long history of doing work on innovation and entrepreneurship. And we're actually now focused on, on economic development in, in rural areas and small cities, and really taking a very human-centered approach to thinking about that. That is, what is it that, that the people who live in smaller towns want and need, and, and how can you encourage them to build businesses and, and, and work together in a, in a regional way? So, so yeah, I, I have a chance just to play all over the place. Uh, it's, it's great fun. It's one of the joys of universities is that they, they give you an opportunity to keep learning stuff. And, and as long as you're doing something, they don't really care what it is. So it's, it's kind of <laughs> well, it's interesting. You bring up rural areas. I heard an idea recently that you might find interesting and maybe you can play off of it a little bit. Something that I heard recently as an idea was when, uh, when you go into a, an area that's rural and you start adding stuff like uh, better, you know, like co-working spaces and better job opportunities. A lot of people would argue that that actually makes it harder to live. But on the other side, it also says that maybe you're giving more opportunities or different opportunities that weren't there before. You know, kind of like the gentrification that we're seeing in East Austin currently. Mm. Do you think that's a positive or a negative effect on the people that were there before? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's, it's a really difficult question because, you know, w one of the things that we see in a lot of small towns is that on the one hand, they'd like there to be more economic activity, but on the other hand, they don't want the community to lose its identity. And I, I think one of the reasons why small communities struggle is that, that a lot of times what they try to do is to grow businesses from the outside, meaning let me bring in a factory that somebody else owns that's going to employ 40 people, or let me see if I can get someone, some entrepreneur from out of town to relocate here. And, and a lot of times there, there is a, a nucleus of small business in communities that could grow and employ more people and actually have deeper roots in the community, except that um, the people who run those businesses don't necessarily have the expertise to, to run something larger than what they're currently running. And so an alternative is to do things to really promote growth from the, 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 the businesses that are already feeding that community and, and, and giving them access to a little bit more business expertise, 
finding ways for them to borrow just a little bit of money to expand, but doing it in a responsible way where it comes along with people who understand what that growth means. And, and when that happens, then you, you, you get a little bit less tension than you get when you create spaces that are designed primarily to attract people from the outside, which is often what happens when you build a co-working space or, or, or attract, you know, do, you know, give an economic incentive to get someone else to relocate in your town. And I think, I think, you know, you need to use all the tools at your disposal, but, but biasing towards building things that are, that, that, that will feel comfortable to the residents is an important first step so that people don't wake up one day and, and, and find themselves feeling like they live in a community that isn't theirs anymore. Yeah, interesting. I love that. So it's a softer, I'm sure you've heard in, in, in your travels the, the, the adage or the analogy, uh, how do you boil a frog? Well, yeah. a little bit at a time. That's right. Kind of exactly. that you don't want to shock the community. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and, and if you look at the growth of Austin, I mean, you know, Austin is clearly, I mean, I've been in Austin for 21 and a half years. It's a, it's a very different community now than it was then. And of course, in the late 90s, it was a very different community than it was in the 80s or the 70s. Sure. But, but there is a, a certain continuity to it. Uh, you know, and, and, and anyone who's been here for any length of time can certainly start complaining about how much we miss some cultural institution that isn't there anymore. But, but, but we've, you know, we've managed to maintain some kind of through line, you know, that, that makes this place remain distinctively Austin. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. I love living here. Yeah, I love living absolutely. Here. So shifting into the topic that I really want to pick your brain about, no pun intended there, <laughs> uh, is perception. So when you're, okay, so let's go ahead and use the analogy or the example of a community. So when you're changing a community, hopefully for the better, what do you think happens to the perception? Let's just say, let's say East Austin, and for those folks that don't know, East Austin was more of a rural area. They started putting these high rises there and it's changed the dynamic completely. It doesn't even feel like East Austin anymore. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about like East Riverside, right? It just, it, it feels like almost downtown now, you know? And so what do, what do you think happens with the perception of an area to the people that live there when you start changing things either rapidly or slowly? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think if you think about what the word perception really refers to, so, so in, in psychology, we often distinguish between sensation and perception, where sensation is the use of those sense organs. So you open your eyes, light hits your retina, and there's a certain amount of, of work that your brain does just to identify where are the edges of the objects and, right. and, and what colors am I seeing and things like that. And, and a fair amount of that happens at, a, at what you could think of as a sensory level. But very quickly, the, the, the table begins to shift a little bit from just sensing what's in the environment to perceiving what's in the environment, which, which includes a certain amount of interpretation of, what you, of what's there. And, and the reason I'm kind of digging into it that way is that as we begin to think about perception of high level things like communities, there's, a, there's this interplay between what's there in the community and then our interpretation of what's there. Mm. And so, you know, we, have a, we, we may have a particular belief about what a community is about. Um, that, that a particular or, or a particular neighborhood, that, that that neighborhood may, you know, we may have a, a, a belief that it is, uh, you know, if it, that it's a bad, you know, that you're in the bad side of town or in the, right, yeah. you know, in an area that's, that, that might be dangerous to go to or an area that, that might be economically disadvantaged. And, and there's a certain amount of, um, there's belief that goes into that, and then that's reinforced by the institutions that you might see there, mm -hmm. uh, or the lack of institutions, right? That wow. there are, you know, that you, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an economically disadvantaged part of town, you might not expect to see newer homes. You might not expect to see businesses that cater to upscale clientele or new right. restaurants or whatever it is. And so, um, you know, when, a, when an area gentrifies, which is, you know, what's happened to East Austin over the last 20 years, you know, you, you started with um, very small changes, 
you know, that, 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 that people would come in, buy a house, fix it up. Uh, an old business or a, or a boarded up storefront might open with a business that was somewhat unexpected there. And initially that doesn't change the whole perception of the neighborhood, although it may attract your attention. You might think, oh, that's interesting. That, that house doesn't look typical for this neighborhood. Right. Over time, of course, as that begins to accelerate, you start seeing a, a more rapid pace of change, which now creates a different set of expectations about what you're gonna see in that neighborhood, which then begins to shift your actual perception of the neighborhood. So now you go from sensing uh, odd, uh, things that are odd for that neighborhood to now beginning to think, oh, this, is a, this part of town is, is no longer, um, you know, it doesn't seem as economically disadvantaged or, or, or you know, and, and but, you know, and so it's changing. And, and, but, but at the same time, you then begin to wonder, so what's happening to all the people who were living here? Uh -huh. right? and of course, you know, one of, the, one of the difficulties I think that cities have to deal with when, specifically when dealing with gentrification is a perceptual problem that has to do with the way that we see the world, which is we tend to see what's present, not what's absent. And so, and so, if you think about the gentrification of East Austin, for example, so, you know, we see this, you know, we see, we saw people buying up houses, fixing, fixing houses that, that might have been in bad shape before, tearing some things down and putting up newer homes. We saw new businesses coming in, which gradually led to the perception that the neighborhood itself had changed. What we didn't see was the people who moved out because they were gone, they left. And there was no perceptual trace of them anymore because many of them had to um, move to other neighborhoods or even to move out of town altogether. And, and so, you know, we see, we see a flight of people who had lived in, in East Austin to uh, some of the southern and eastern suburbs, for example, of the city. Right. And, and one of the difficulties that goes along with that is, of course, we lose more than just, I mean, you know, gentrification certainly has certain economic benefits, but to the extent that, that, that a city is also somewhat racially and ethnically segregated, and Austin has a long history of that kind of racial and ethnic segregation, it, it means that we, we, we are losing uh, heritage, we are losing representation, uh, we're losing diversity, and it's harder to notice that because it's hard to notice the absence of something when it's moved away. And so, you know, that's and that's been a real tension that that Austin has has faced for the last twenty years, as 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 we have seen economic redevelopment on the east side. It's changed, it's changed the way we see the east side. People now think of it as an upscale kind of cool neighborhood. And not just the east side north of I-35, but, but uh, sort of no, no, uh, uh, north of the river rather, but, but south of the river, which you know, there's, there's been I mean, the, the riverside area. You know, those of you who aren't from Austin, you're gonna have to look it up on a map, I'm sorry. Well, but, uh, but, but, but the, you know, historically, the, what we thought of as the east side of town was usually the east side of Austin on the east side of I-35 and north of the river, but actually south of the river as well, uh, there's been a whole slew of new buildings, new businesses, uh, and, and, uh, and gentrification. And that has displaced both uh, a significant uh, amount of the African-American community as well as the, as well as the Hispanic community uh, from, from neighborhoods where, where they'd been living. And, 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 and once, the, once, they, once, those, once a lot of people move out, it's just harder to see. Hard, you, you, we, we perceive the neighborhood differently, but we don't see um, the lack of diversity. We, we That's don't interesting. Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm just going to simply, I want, I want to hit on two points that you mentioned that I found very, very fascinating. So let's say uh, you're a business owner or a leader in your field. And let's apply some of these to that real fast. So let's say, let's take the first thing that I heard and what you said that I find just incredibly fascinating, the, how the perception of a neighborhood, or in this case, maybe a, a business, 
changes with just a slight change. And then, I'm, then I have one more, that's something that you mentioned that I want to address. But first, for the example, you might have a, a lower income area and you had a Starbucks. That'll change the perception. So yeah. if, you were, if you were a business owner or a leader or even a civic leader, what effect, like, I, I don't know if there's like a scale, but what type of effect can just a slight change have? So again, a, a lot of it has to do with, can you influence the way that people are interpreting what they see? And so, and so uh, you know, if you think about, well, I'm, I'm trying to create or signal a change in a, in a neighborhood or a change in my business, one of the things you want to pay attention to is what are the, what are the, what, what available information are people using that is leading them to interpret my neighborhood, my business in a particular way? Mm. Those are the elements that then can lead you to, if you make a change in those elements, can lead to the biggest shift in perception. So, for example, you know, if you think about coffee houses, which, which you know, whether it's a Starbucks or a, or a locally owned kind of hip coffee shop you know they coffee shops have have several functions you know on the one hand they they are a gathering place for people which which is incredibly important sometimes more important than a co-working space actually it's a lot of a lot of towns invest in a uh in in a co-working space when what they really need is just a good coffee shop yeah uh, which which at least has a revenue model associated with it uh, <laughs> and food and food, right, exactly, you know. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, coffee shops signal, you know, they cater to a particular kind of people, you know, the people who, who sit in a coffee shop, they tend to skew a little younger, uh, they, they, they tend to, to be sort of active and, and uh, you know, there's, there's usually a lot of, it, it, it spurs conversation and, and it's, it's a place where you'll see people really trying to get some remote work done you know, all of these are, are, are interesting things, right? Which, which, you know, so one of the reasons why, why having a kind of hip coffee shop in a neighborhood begins to change the perception is that if you begin to think of this as, oh, this is the kind of neighborhood that's got a place where I can go hang out. That's a, you know, now, now you're looking at this neighborhood as a place you might want to spend time as opposed to a place you want to get through as quickly as possible. And to the extent that that coffee shop has a bunch of people in it, you're thinking, wow, this is a place where a whole bunch of people think this is a place that people ought to hang out. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and not to like, you know, not to pick out any business, but like when you go to Walmart, you don't want to hang out, but you go to Target, they have a coffee shop and so sometimes a small restaurant or, you know, here in, in Texas, you have Randall's where they might have literally a restaurant inside of it. You, know, you yeah. kind of want to hang out a little bit longer. So right. if you have a business or a personal brand or you're trying to promote some sort of message, if you want people to stay, putting little changes to it, it's kind of psychologically incentivizing them. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it, I think it creates a little bit of an incentive, but it also then it, 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 it gives people that opportunity to reframe what they're seeing. So if you think about the difference between, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, lower income neighborhoods, for example, instead of having a grocery store, they often have, you know, a dollar general, a dollar general, right. or, or, or a, you know, a store like that where you can buy some food, but those stores are not designed as a place where people should linger. Right. Uh, you know, fact, certainly you linger, they get, they start watching you. Exactly. Exactly. They, and 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 so, you know, by by creating, you know, as you point out, a, you know, a Randall's or a, you know, certainly an upscale chain like a Whole Foods, they right. they encourage people to come do their shopping for sure. But, but to also spend some time. And, and, and so, you know, when, and, and part of that is the feeling that this is a place where one ought to slow down a little bit mm. and, 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 and to spend, you know, and where the businesses are catering, not just to some basic need, but to a broader need for social connection. Mm. And, and so, you know, and, 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 and so seeing that, you know, and, and of course, Part of it too is, you know, from a perception standpoint, is do I see the sort of place that for that my that my identity tells me is a place I ought to hang out? Mm. So, so um, you know, when I talk about 
about a coffee shop signaling something about younger, a younger, hipper crowd, it's because the sort of people who look at a coffee shop and think of it as a place that they might want to sit down and spend a few hours tend to be a little younger, a little more tech savvy and things like that. You know, certainly um, in, 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 you know, historically many African-American neighborhoods, the barber shop was a place where people right. hung out, you know. And, Even the and corner store. Right. And those were those became um, central places in town where people spent time. Right. And, you know, and, and that was a, a different set of cultural signals mm. about, you know, and, 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 and having, having a thriving place that you recognize as, as, a, as a community center mm -hmm. is, is important for, for that sense that you belong there. You know, the kinds of people who see coffee shops as places where other types of people hang out are not going to look at that coffee shop as an invitation to be a part of that neighborhood. Interesting. That's so fascinating. We could probably go on for two hours about it. But, you know, we want to be respectful of everybody's time. I want to hit that second point. Sure. So, as you mentioned in the initial uh, monologue there, I thought so interesting is our perception of not noticing what's gone. Right. And I think that's often missed. So let's transfer that into a business or a civic leader or a brand, or if you have a message, sometimes taking out something can have an effect because we don't know that it wasn't there. Right. Yeah. That's so it, yeah. Can, can you explain what, what type of an effect does that have? You know, if you have a, say you're in a, a rural area and you have a coffee shop and you take it out, it can yeah. have a drastic effect on the, on the vibe of the community. Yeah, it, you know, it's, so what's interesting is when something goes missing, it, yeah. it, you know, it's, it, can be, it can be felt as a loss to the people who are part of that neighborhood because it's not there and they, and they wish it was still there. But, but to those people who are looking in, you know, uh, new, you know, in a new way at, at a place, that absence now is just it doesn't it, it now doesn't call attention to what's missing and so you know as we and 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 that's one of the reasons why you know if you look at a place like austin i mean you know old time austinites will every austinite points to some cultural institution that's not here anymore okay. and says well that's when this place started going downhill yeah you know, ranging all the way from you know old timers who say when liberty lunch disappeared that was you know that was it um to you know to more recent departures where something may you know a particular restaurant may close or something like that but but the fact is you know the reason that austin has remained a pretty uh a, a, a pretty vibrant and, and 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 hip place is in part because even though particular institutions disappear the you know we still manage to replace them with other things and so most people with looking at at the at a particular neighborhood with fresh eyes only see what's there Mm -hmm. They don't see what isn't. And so, and, and, and what happens eventually is, you know, unlike, unlike, you know, the kind of perception we do as individuals where you open your eyes and try to interpret what's going on, your perception of a brand, your perception of a community has a strong social communal focus to it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after a while, you know, in a place like Austin, for example, you know, somebody says, oh, this place started going you know, uh, going downhill when Liberty Lunch closed. And then everybody else in the room kind of rolls their eyes like, well, there he goes again, you know, <laughs> because, because they're, they're saying, well, you're missing the point. There's so many other cool things here. And so now the, the you know, and, and that actually often has the influence of getting somebody to stop harping about the, the thing that's missing because socially everybody has this agreement about what it is that we perceive. And there's actually precedent for this, even in the, in the psychological perception literature. There's, there's some great work going back to the 1920s um, uh, on, on social norms, mm -hmm. suggesting that, that you can actually get people to, to um, agree about, about perceptual illusions and, and the lengths of lines just by creating social conformity. You know, if there's strong social pressure to believe you saw something, eventually you come to think you saw it. Right. So, right. so uh, you know, I think, I think that social pressure matters a lot. You're, you, what you're doing is, is when you're trying to make a change is to give people enough evidence that they could believe that they're perceiving a particular thing. 
Wow. And then, and then try and create enough social pressure around that, that, that you achieve some consensus that this is the, 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 the way something ought to be viewed. Right. So, so, you know, you could ask the question, why is Austin, Texas cool? And the answer is because everybody thinks it's cool. Right. And that's, and that's literally, I think, a true answer. It's, it's yeah. it, you know, at some point, if everybody thinks it's cool, you start looking at it and, get, and, and, and interpreting everything as, oh, I, this must be really cool. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I, and so I think, I think the, the key here, one of the key takeaways here is that there's two sides to every perception. Yeah. You know, there really is two sides. You know, you, you have the people that are leaving, perceiving the, the neighborhood is changing, and the people that are coming in saying, oh, it looks real nice and fresh. Yeah. And if you were to apply that to a message, you know, you write a met like a speech for somebody, they're not going to know what you took out. Right. You are. And That's you right. Make sure you don't influence yourself being all bent out of shape that you took out a paragraph. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because, because nobody else sees it that way. Right. You exactly. just see what, what they've been presented with. And I think, I think that's really important. You know, from a civic standpoint, of course, one of the things that, that's important to, to capture in this is that, is that we have to be mindful that because we stop paying attention to many of the things that have been lost, mm -hmm. uh, there may be important elements of our identity or our history that we're losing in the process that we want to to try to be as mindful of as possible and make sure that those things that we lose, we have lost because we've made the conscious choice to lose them and not because that was the, the side effect of a bunch of changes that we might have done differently had we thought a little bit more carefully in advance. Right, and I, I think it's also important to note that, you know, if we're consciously losing, deliberately losing something, we want to make sure that we're doing it in the pursuit of something that's of a higher good. That's right. Yeah, for right. sure, for sure. Okay, well, I don't want to keep you through your afternoon. I really, really appreciate this, and my viewers will really, really appreciate this. Before we leave here, I want you to go ahead and mention a couple things that are coming up for you. Do you have a couple articles coming out? That he, I mean, guys, this guy's super prolific, and he told me something right before we got on here and he's thinking about doing another book. So can you, can you kind of give us some insight? What's coming up for you next? Yeah, so, um, so I, what I will say is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always writing small stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I try to, you know, much as, you know, I, I certainly try to sell books, but, but I give away as much as I can, as you well know. So anybody who follows me on social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, I, I write weekly for Fast Company as often as I can for psychology today and probably once a month or so for, for Harvard Business Review. So I try to give this stuff away as often as I can. I uh, certainly have the, the podcast that, uh, you know, and, and radio show, Two Guys in Your Head, that comes out every week. So you know, that's, that's really just trying to take as much psychology content as I can and throwing it out there for people who are thinking about business, people thinking about their personal lives. Um, you know, on the, on the front of next big projects, in addition to the, that sort of smaller scale writing, I'm playing around with a couple of potential book ideas. You know, uh, I, there's, a, there's a lot of work on, 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 on taking a very broad approach to thinking about conflict resolution uh, that, that I'm, I'm interested in and thinking of, of trying to, uh, to, to maybe put a, a book around. But but also, you know, because I'm doing so much work on thinking about economic development, uh, you know, in these smaller communities, at some point, there's going to be a project there, whether it's my next book or the one after that. Um, because, you know, what's going on in cities, which is often used as a model for everybody else, is actually not the right way to think about what you do in a smaller community uh, when you're trying to, to help it to grow. And so, so that's, uh, you know, those are, those are some things I'm, I'm playing around. Good stuff. Always good stuff. I will list links in the description to all your various outlets that you're a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally have several of this guy's books and I love them. They will, you know, when you get a library, you start building a library, you start to decide what books are going to be lifetime books. And I have selected his books as some of the books that I'm going to keep forever. I mean, they're easy to read, they're conversational, and they will, I mean, every time I come back to them, I see I, my perception changes. So, well, I appreciate it. So, so Art, you. I really appreciate it. 
best of luck to you. We'll come back around to you in like a year or so probably and see where you are. And uh, I will definitely list some links and you guys got to check this stuff out. Art, thank you so much. My pleasure. It was great talking with you as always. All right. See ya.